That's so funny. I actually, Sarah, I was, I always tell people, I always forget, but literally at that moment I would, I had remembered I was about to do it. So, <laughs> okay. Okay, everyone, let's go ahead and uh, begin. Before we begin, can I like designate someone to go to the door if it rings? I will. Okay. Well, Alexis chimed in first. So, yeah. <laughs> So, yes, no, I, 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 like a roll sheet. Oh, I don't really take roll that much in my college classes, but it is basically roll, is what you're describing. All right. That makes sense. I, I think I think our regulars are here and online. So, um, and I, I because of everything that's been happening, um, I forgot to put out a uh, announcement about us returning. So it's all good though. Um, but like I we do we have a good turnout. Like I said, I said to the uh, folks in the room. We're going to like sort of dive in, immerse ourselves in this discussion on new Jewish religious movements, which will carry over beyond the ones today. Um, and we're not going to talk about anything that's happening in the world um, because I think we all need an escape. And that's kind of how I'm feeling about that right now. Right. Yeah. OK, cool, cool, cool. All right. So with that said, let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Oh, wait, I just turned the zoom. Oh, one second. Okay, one sec. Okay, you all see that? Can everyone yeah. online see that? Uh, yes. Good. Okay. Let's go ahead and start the slideshow. Excuse me, class. Let's have oh, some. Uh... <laughs> <We're talking about laughs> <me. laughs> okay. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I asked. Um, well, actually, John asked me, um, but I'll ask you as well. Do you know who this gentleman is right here? Anyone know? He looks familiar, but I don't know who he is. I thought so it was you for a minute. Yeah, you know, it was me. I'm honored. I'm honored. <laughs> so Alexis. No. Hoffman? Ho Hoffman? No. No. Yeah. So you're you're getting closer, Daryl. Is it uh, Cat Stevens? Video. Cat, it's not Cat Stevens, now known as Yusuf Islam, um, but uh, but it is a similar, a similar. Like, well, it's not quite. No, it's not Cat Stevens. This is someone who was. He's not Muslim. <laughs> yeah. All right, I will just come out and say it. This is um, this is formerly a gentleman formerly known as Dr. Richard Alpert, who in the 1960s oh, went to became oh, yeah. Ram Dass. So that is Ram Dass, a little bit mm. older than when he That's... first um, mm. uh, became uh, a guru. Basically, um, certainly younger uh, than uh, looking younger than how he did um, when he passed away in 2019. Um, but yeah, that's Ram Dass. Ram Dass was Jewish. His name was Richard Alpert. Um, he was a professor of psychology at Harvard, I believe. And he uh, tuned in and dropped out, as Timothy Leary said, and he went to India, studied with um, his guru there, and ended up becoming a, a Hindu guru in his own right. But still, especially as he was later in life, retained some connections to his Jewishness, which is really fascinating to me. And we'll talk a little bit about him. Um, but I want to, I, I kind of heard everyone and we, we ended up finishing it anyway, but I definitely heard like the pushback. It's like, okay, we need to stop talking about these messianic folks. And yet I still think that there is a lot of interesting ground to cover when we talk about Jewish engagement in America with other religious traditions. Um, and then also 
Jewish religious innovations within the United States as well. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. So I have this phrase here, Jew religious movements. And I know that I've said to everybody that um, I hate when like there are Jewish uh, uh, seminars or something where there's some silly little pun. And of course, I go and do it myself. <laughs> Jew religious movements as opposed to new religious movements. So this section is about Jewish involvement in new and alternative religions. Daryl, go ahead. You know, interesting comment you made because part of Christianity. Is there some reason why they were retired? Is there some reason why folks were retired? Well, first of all, I didn't pull everybody. Um, I, there, but I think people were tired. I think a lot of students uh, were a little tired of hearing about basically Christians, right? And 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 Christian use of our traditions. And I understand it. I understand it. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to move a little bit out of that. So. When we talk about new religious movements, what's another, is there another term that you think of when you hear the phrase new religious movement? It's actually more, it's the more popular term. I know the word. Yeah, I'm going to have to like tell you when I'm ready to call on you, John. <laughs> Besides you. So it's so a new age, so the, the new age is sometimes considered part of, or one of these. Yes. Yeah. What about the folks online? If you hear the, have you ever heard the phrase "new religious movement" or "alternative religion"? And if so, have is there another term that you have heard that you're more familiar with that describes these groups? Do you mean like Jews, like Jewish Buddhists? So, like they're going to fall into this category, right? Sort of, yeah, yeah, Boo Jews or Jews, kind of adjacent to Ramdas, who we might call a Hindu. Um, but no, the term I'm looking for, actually, John, you want to say it? Cult. Yeah, cult, right? Cult. Um, and I heard the term thrown around quite a bit when we talked about messianics, and we're going to problematize that term today. But before we do that, I kind of let it slide, but uh, we're going to... I saw your look. Yeah. <laughs> John says, I saw I saw your look. Okay. But before we do that, let's, let's just kick this term around a bit. I'm always happy to kick this term around in a, uh, in a sort of negative sense. The AC should be on. Yeah. Do you want to turn it down a bit? Go ahead and turn it down. That's fine. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Hill. <laughs> so what is a cult? Does it have to be have a leader? So uh, Alexis says, does it have to have a leader? So I'm going to just sort of like, I'm going to just, uh, rather than responding, I'm just going to speak your responses and then we'll go into it. Genevieve. Um, I've heard that uh, people who've done a cult now prefer the term high control group. Okay, so you're using the term high control group, right? And when you say, and, and Genevieve says, the people who study cults use the term high control group, which I've noticed that as well. Um, but when you say people who study cults, who are you referring to? Like, um, I guess for the people who study it in a scholarly sense. Okay, people who study in a scholarly sense. It's possibly the people who study it in a scholarly sense, though I don't know about that. So, uh, and you made reference to, Genevieve makes reference to the people who, who uh, engage in rescuing from cults. All right, anyone else? What is a cult? Or what do we think of when we think of a cult? Like okay. they they separate you from your from the outside world from your family and friends. Yeah, so they separate. So um, Janine, you said at the same time as Sherry, uh, you said they separate you from. We associate them with separation from the outside world, family, friends, etc. Sherry said it's a, a group that people join, right? What else? Can you hear me, Sean? I can hear you, Faith. Yes, good to see you. Oh yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I I broke my knee, so <laughs> no, that's all right. Um. A cult is a, well, it's a fringe group mm -hmm. and propounding a, um, a uh, radical, maybe a radical idea. Okay, so. What we consider a radical idea. A fringe group with radical ideas. Okay. Alexis? Uh, I was thinking, is it something that's outside of mainstream culture? Yeah. So, okay. So something that's outside of mainstream culture. That's what Alexis okay. says. Yeah, similar to what Faith said. Yeah, Daryl. Okay. So, so Daryl says he's starting to see things in the mainstream becoming cults, and I'm glad you said that because when, but I'll, but I'll come back. Let me circle back to that because John wants to add something too. No, I don't. Oh, you don't? I thought I saw your hand. I thought you were about to say two and I'm no, I'm not well. So John referenced QAnon, which is a, which is a um, a conspiracy theory oriented online movement that is largely supportive of uh, Trump 
and is traffics pretty heavily in conspiracy theories um has bled out into the mainstream of the right wing um and that, that's who yeah well and that's how that's sort of what that's what john's referring to one other thing sean yes the group usually has a charismatic leader okay so faith was that you yes okay yeah so faith says the group has a charismatic leader okay so the, oh genevieve go ahead there's often a financial often a financial element where they take your money okay um yeah that is that is a, that this is a, po a popular um uh descriptor of what a cult is anyone else want to chime in real fast before i move on okay so yeah so hillary asked if we're going to go over what some cults are and we will in a moment we're going to go over some what some groups that have been referred to as jewish cults and then next week we're going to talk about spiritualism and uh uh you know ghost beliefs and that sort of thing uh yes hillary it's a little off but like okay are there because i've heard like cults kind of like referred to as like oh that's a cult, like kind of like in a negative like negative term but yes like, is there like actual things that are classified as like this is Okay. okay, so Hillary asked a really great question. She always hears it in a pejorative negative term. Um, so is are there like more specific, is there a specific classification of, of whether, uh, is this a cult or is that a cult? What is a cult? And Genevieve, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Genevieve says, what about the ancient world when we talk about like the cult of Isis or, yeah, it is a different use. <laughs> and so that I would refer to as a very technical usage. Um, and I don't even, I'm not an anthropologist or, um, you know, a, a scholar of antiquity. So I can't speak to whether or not this is still in use. I don't know. Um, but yeah, as far as I, you know, as far as I know, uh, that, that when it's used to refer to, like I said, the cult of Isis or some or cult of Osiris, um, it's a very technical, precise term to refer to a temple, like go polytheistic god or goddess veneration at a temple, or not always polytheistic, like, you know, our ancient temple, some scholars have referred to that as like the cult of, you know, the, yeah, the temple sacrificial cult, exactly. Um, so to answer your question, is that connected to like what we're talking about here, the popular sense? No, the popular sense of the term almost always refers to the popular understanding of these groups, right? Um, Daryl, go ahead, and then I'm going to move on. Explain your term popularization. When the people describe cults, so I'm going back to the 50s and 60s business world, I mean, uh, certain cars were cults. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a Chevrolet, had a Chevrolet, and they leave them out the car. You know, all this. You yeah. See, as a cult, but we didn't associate that as cult. So I, I'm glad, again, I'm glad you said that as well, because what this tells us is that there's a lot of slippage when we use this term. And we're not on sound um epistemological territory or yeah, am i using the right word there we're not on, we're not on sound ground when we're talking about what a cult is because this term and the descriptors that are used for cult are um can be applied basically to anything we don't like socially now right now you're thinking but but you know sagan what about the charismatic leader, right? What about the brainwashing? What about all these things that we refer to? And 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 and, and the, what my, the point that I'm going to hopefully make in a moment is that those descriptors, while they are relevant to some of these groups, um, they also are relevant to all other so many other social and uh, phenomenon and groupings as well um, within businesses, for instance, or within politics. John, go ahead. Where there have been ones that haven't relied on um, a charismatic leader and just like it, it, they just kind of spiral by self policing amongst the members. Yeah. So John John asks if are there uh, groups that you know have are the way this term is applied to that have not necessarily had a charismatic leader. But have and then you said they spiral among their yeah, like it spirals into like the negativity uh -huh. like self policing amongst them. Yeah, so a high control group. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm sure I'll think of one. I can't think of one off the top of my head. I I would say what I would say actually, you see behavior like that 
where basically, again, you don't have a charismatic leader, but, um, or I, I would say, or I would say when we don't see a group that's like distinct and separate, sometimes we'll see individual congregations where that happens within a congregation. And that's another area of slippage of where we say, okay, there's, you know, that, that synagogue, they're just so culty, right? They, they, you know, hear things like this all the time. Um, they, uh, <laughs> and, but the idea is that like, so a lot of these, these um, ideas of what we think of as cults, we can apply to any religious behavior that we don't like, even religious behavior that is within a mainstream religious tradition. So, oh, I had a question online. Yes. Well, I just wanted to say that um, you're asking what is a cult. I would turn it around and say, uh, a religion is just a cult that stood the test of time. Uh, so, yeah, that 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 is absolutely one way that scholars have looked at it, right? And especially when you look at religious syncretism, how you have breakaway religious movements from a larger religion um, that are sort of that, that are seen as outside the mainstream. Over time, these traditions become they become accepted as a religion right but then that brings and, and oftentimes when we look at that from that perspective we might use the phrase new religious movement a religious movement that has emerged from other religions or even seemingly out of full cloth although they're never fully out of full cloth um that that's like brand new right the problem with that is when does a new religious movement stop being new so let me move on here oh there's another there's another question in the chat was there? Oh, sure. Okay, Sherry, go ahead. Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought up the Manson family. Uh, Sherry mentioned the Manson family and the Manson murders. Um, they, they are a very sensationalist. Uh, organization. So, one of the thing, one of the reasons this this narrative of cult really takes hold in the 1960s is because the baby boomer generation ends up rejecting their you know their traditional religious practices and going off and joining these other religious movements, joining the Hare Krishnas, joining the Jesus People movement, so on and so forth. And at the same time, you do have these sensationalist events like the Manson family, the People's Temple and a few others as well. But the vast majority of these groups don't spiral to violence like the Manson family or the People's Temple do. So this is another aspect of why, why the term cult is problematic. We immediately think of the Manson family, or we immediately think of the People's Temple, Jim Jones, right? Or we immediately think of the Branch Davidians, uh, the, you know, the Waco uh, uh, standoff. But the fact of the matter is the vast majority of people who join alt or, or take part in alternative religions are not part of anything like that. Um, so the Jewish, oh, well, go ahead. Say basically cult has a negative connotation, but doesn't necessarily need to be negative. Uh, no, I'm saying that cult is, is not useful when studying religions. And I'll get to that slide in a moment. So Genevieve mentioned a moment ago, like there are people who study um these groups and what was the phrase you used? High control. These are, yeah, study high control groups. So those people are almost entirely within the field of psychology and sociology. Um, and that's the way they look at it. And that's cool. In the field of religious studies, we don't look at it that way. We look at it at, we sort of take them, as I've mentioned, we talked about messianic groups. We, in order to understand their religious belief and practice, we have to try to not engage in pejoratives and to call a group a high control group uh, call is is not only is it pejorative but also there's plenty of non-religious groups that are you know high control groups because that's just something that human beings do we fall under the influence of charismatic people and then we sort of walk together in lockstep it is a human phenomenon that exists outside of the world of religion but also in mainstream religions as well so you can look at you can go to a, a if you have a a charismatic, yeah, a mega church or a charismatic priest or something like that, or just one, a, a religious organization where everyone feels really close together, you're going to see those same phenomenon, right? Daryl, go ahead. So if I'm in the front office of the cult or charismatic figures, mm -hmm. I can say a group of cults, but sports cults. Yeah. There's nobody that stands yeah. out leading it. Yeah, so Daryl says he thinks of like sports fans as a, a, a group without charismatic leaders, but 
there's another one and it's more of a it is a idea and it starts with a leader although i don't know if i'd call him charismatic um although he was charismatic enough to have uh followers and this is a leader dur- um of a sort of a fil- a metaphysical idea during the middle of the 19th century and the ideas that he came up with will end up influencing the vast majority of American new religious movements, and frankly, will end up influencing American consciousness itself. So I'm going to throw some ideas up on the screen here, and I want you to tell me if you agree with them or not. All right, here we go. Yeah, here we go. So how many of you believe in the power of positive thinking? Okay, I see one. No, and be honest, I'm not trying to do a gotcha here, right? Raise your hand in the room. What do you mean by power? Do you mean like yeah, I just. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, are we talking about like power? Just like, if you how okay, how about this? I'll, I'll, so Alexis says, "What do I mean by power?" And I saw a couple hands. I saw Janine's hand. Yeah. yeah. So if you if you can, yeah, by thinking positively, can you positively influence your, you know, life? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Almost everyone. I see a little bit of waffling, right? Yeah. Okay. I had to fire up this uh, acting job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Time of work. Yeah. So Daryl says that he, uh, he, you know, he could get people fired up and like could actually could achieve like you know what he was trying to achieve. Being, being single, mm-hmm. you're more likely to get dates if you're positive. <laughs> yeah, Alexa says being <laughs> being single, you're more likely to get uh, dates if you're positive rather than negative. So this is, and and I use this phrase intentionally, right? Because you hear this all the time. Time. Like you need to believe in the power of positive thinking. You need to be positive. I, when I was struggling to find um, consistent academic work, something that I never actually found, people would say, you just need to be positive. You need to put your best foot, foot best foot forward. Now that idea. Yeah. It is particularly difficult. So uh, Genevieve says academia is a rigged game, and that's true. It's particularly difficult when you are a scholar of religion and you know exactly where that language came from. So let's continue this a little bit. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna deepen it a little more. Who believes in casting your dreams into the universe to see what sticks? You have a dream. Speak that dream. Bring it into the universe, and you can achieve that dream. Who believes that? that? The universe is bringing it about, or that your positive thinking is bringing it about. Okay. So, but but if you believe it's positive thinking, then you do believe in the first one, right? Okay. All right. Okay. John. Yes, I just thought of something. Uh, the first question: Who believes in the power? Would you equate that with optimism? Would I equate that with optimism? Um, yes, I and no. An I would say that it is a. Well, I don't want to give too much away, but I would say that that the power of positive thinking is kind of a metaphysical optimism. Oh, it is a ritualized optimism, or at least okay. a okay. a spiritualized optimism. It's All the right. idea that you can. If you want something enough that you can make it happen just by wanting it, no. right? No. No. See, this is where it gets into metaphysical territory, and there are, but pretty much. This, so this this doesn't. So this when I have a small class where half the class is online, half the class is in the room, I and it's it, it, the um it doesn't really the, the force of this question doesn't come across when I ask this cla- this uh, question to a lecture hall filled with students and the vast majority of students throw their hands up in the air, then you can truly see how deeply embedded these ideas are in American consciousness. The second one is as well. It's a little new agey. I made it a little new agey, but like you're, even if you don't believe it, you've seen this sort of talk before, right? we you're familiar with it. I imagine most of us are. Okay. Now we're getting, uh, so Genevieve, oh, you, you yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Genevieve, without looking at the slide, uh, saw my third one. Who believes in channeling positive energy through a vision board? Has anyone used a vision board before? Oh, I, I don't even know what a vision board okay. is. What, what, Hillary's going to explain it. What, like, what do you want to happen on a vision board? And, like, yeah, vision you take a board, like a, like a, a poster board or, or foam core or, or whatever, and you either write or you 
take images and you post the images on the vision board and you affirmatively think of those images. So if you want to be financially free, you put an image of money on the board and you concentrate on that. You can say, I'm going to be financially free. I'm going to uh, have financial um, you know, freedom. If you want to go on a vacation, you put that wherever you want to go on the board and you're like, I'm going to make it to Hawaii. I'm going to be there and, and so on and so forth. So vision boards are... So vision boards are, I, I would say, a ritualized form of the power of positive thinking, right? I With did this vision board um, a couple of weeks ago at the JCC in Long Beach. It was a vision board project. I don't know if you care, but... <laughs> no, no, no I, I, I super care about that. So you were at the JCC. <laughs> I did one of the... Yeah. And the JCC is doing vision boards. No. I love it. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, John doesn't. John, There's a reason why John doesn't. We'll come around to that. Uh, <laughs> you mean like what so, do you mean? How, how did you feel about doing that well I mean I'm since I'm retired I don't have like a lot of solid goals and things so my so mine's a little goofy but it was just things I want to do during retirement yeah just cool. listening to jazz and going swimming and you know um, yeah. living and culture and just stuff I wanted to do and I imagine that this is for you, this was a way to um, just sort of have a fun night at the JCC and kind of like think about the things you want to do and sort of make a list of goals so you could like be focused on that, right? Yeah. And it was fun. And they had snacks and wine. They had snacks and wine. <laughs> yeah. The wine is the key, right? I, I, for me, at least. I would go to any sort of power of positive thinking thing if they were giving me uh, free wine. Uh, Sherry, go ahead. Oh, like if you did a vision board, that's what would be on it? I th that's I haven't heard of one of those yet. Although there may be some leaders who say they can read minds. Daryl, go ahead. How long have vision boards been around? I don't know exactly. I would guess that the... the Daryl asked how long have they been around. My guess is that... John's looking it up, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing this is a middle of the uh, 20th century thing. Yeah. I don't know. I can see that going back to the Yeah. Yes. So late 20th. So, so Genevieve says it was popularized by The Secret, which is a book that is sort of very uh, important to the law of attraction, social, like popular philosophy, which is a version of this movement. OK, it's a version of this movement that we call new thought. And I'm going to sort of come to that. Um, John, would you say that would you say that a vision board is a concrete um, visual expression of affirmations yes i would say that that's exactly how they're treated absolutely yeah daryl go ahead yeah yeah well, I mean, I can't speak for ignoring it, but I can say that um, uh, what you're describing, what Daryl's describing is like a management technique of basically doing this sort of thing. And I don't know about that specifically, but I do know that uh, this sort of thinking and also a lot of Christian thinking is very, very much part of business in America. Is it Christian or specifically Protestant? Well, this, this right here, this is... This is so yeah specifically Protestant, but this is a little bit different. Okay, yeah. No, no, but I meant, yeah. That was going to be my okay. question. Like, how much of this is kind of stimulating the cesspool? Well, I wouldn't necessarily call it the cesspool, especially when we're looking at it from a religious studies perspective. But how much of it is in business world a lot, yeah. right? The idea of like. Um, I need to, I can, I envision myself as being part of the C-suite, you know, I'm going to run my own company. I like that, all of that. So I'm going to be wealthy, all these things. And, and the idea of like having positive affirmation about it, all of that is rooted in new thought ultimately. Although there is a lot of interconnection into like with some Christian movements, with other forms of new thought, with uh, the new age in general, it's just sort of this big tangled, like, you know, mess. All right. So um, actually, you mentioned uh, one of you mentioned like a more. So here, 
you know, that's now we're going to get a little bit more weird, right? Who believes, I shouldn't have said weird, but bear with me. Who believes that God will bless you with material success if you give money to the synagogue? Uh. <laughs> 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 I, don't know, I hope so, because I give a lot. No, just kidding. <laughs> I mean, this is this is my way of like you know this is this is my high holiday appeal right <laughs> so everybody everybody we're gonna pass around a card and <laughs> right like so nobody believes this right nobody here daryl do you <laughs> but i'm yeah, God that, but that, this is different. This is different it's, from, so Daryl says, but if, what if you just give money to the synagogue, then things will be better for me. This is different from, this isn't about building a community. This is about, I want to be wealthy. And so if I give money to this good organization, right, then God will bless me with material wealth. What does that sound like? Magical thinking. Oh, okay, but aside from being magical thinking, is there, are there, have you heard of prosperity gospel? No. Prosperity what? Prosperity gospel. Gospel. So this is a Christian movement, but this Christian movement is rooted in new thought. And it's the belief that if you give money to the church, that God will not make things better in the church for you, but will see that you have more money in the future. This is an actual belief, and it comes under a lot of fire in popular culture because it's you know seen as something that fleeces parishioners of their money and enriches the, uh, the, the pastors who do this sort of thing. And there is an element of truth to that, but also the parishioners who give money see that as a type of tithing, right? So... Um, my point in bringing this up here isn't to like talk about prosperity gospel. I think we've talked about evangelicalism enough, right? My point is to say that this is another iteration of where we see this way of thinking, right? And it manifests in different ways. It manifests in this like, what? How could they give money? How could they do such a thing? It anywhere from that to, I believe that I have positive affirmations that good things will happen to me. Okay. Who believes in the, the healing power of prayer? Uh, I, uh, it doesn't matter okay all right okay one two three who anyone online i guess <laughs> we engage in this every week we say misha barak right that's not what i mean though right that, well and daryl daryl just I, I know what you're talking about there's been some evidence that like people who are prayed over like that know they're being prayed over, right? And the mind is very, very powerful. We, Yeah, absolutely. But I'm not, and this is how most Americans see that. And they say, of course, I believe in that. And we say Misha Barach every week. And that's what we're doing. That's not what it's referring to. John, what's it referring to? Although that's how people think about it. Don't go to a doctor, go to a practitioner. It means don't go to a doctor, go to a practitioner or pray. Oh, Christian science. Christian science, and this is one of the, and actually more specifically, who no one here believes this, I know, I think, uh, who believes that medicine and medical care is unnecessary, healing occurs through prayers and positive thoughts. I know that nobody believes that, uh, but this is one of the, Daryl believes it. Daryl Baker Eddy. <laughs> Good one. 98% of the offices for doctors aren't necessary. People would get well on their own. Yeah, so that, but that's different. You're, you're referring, so Daryl says, uh, he was, Harris Stutman told him that 90% of doctor visits aren't necessary. People get well on their own. And that's true. If I'm like, if, I, if I'm coughing and I go to the doctor and the doctor says, you have a respiratory infection, it's not COVID, it's not the flu, sure. it's not bacterial, go home, have some chicken soup, get some rest, right? I didn't even go to the doctor for that, but people go for that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who specifically specifically say, I won't go to the doctor, I'm going to pray. I won't go to the doctor, I'm going to see a practitioner. I'm not going to get chemotherapy, I'm not going to be, I'm going to pray. I'm going to have positive thoughts. And lots and lots of people feel like, think this. And in fact, this notion of being positive went out of the world of Christian science and out of evangelical Christianity during the pandemic and sort of took hold within the new age, right? Within the new age groups uh, who were like, I don't yeah, need to yeah. get this vaccine. Yeah. I don't need to do that. I just need to think positively or I need to pray or I need to do all this sort of holistic medicine, right? 
Yeah. I would, of course, is older than the pandemic, um, but specifically like the vaccine, it really took hold during the pandemic. And I would say emerged out of just new age groups and took hold among mainstream. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 It's a type of self-hypnosis. And of course, if you convince yourself, you're going to say it works. So I'm going to move ahead a little bit here. Um, what are these all from? The first one from general American culture. The second one is sort of new agey. The third one is specifically from the law of attraction, which is a modern form of new thought. The four, then prosperity gospel, healing power of prayer, general American culture, but connected to Christian science, ultimately. Okay. Because I can talk. Oh, jo yeah. Jo because you've given away what this is all about. Okay. Um, John's going to uh, add a little bit of your experience yes. with this. Okay. Um, especially with... Um, and I'll try to reiterate if you, if you can't hear him. I have experience with everything on that list. But, um, but um, there's a... Especially the... If you give money, you'll make more money. Mm -hmm. I, I have strong memories of being in church and the religious science books that I grew up in. Uh, but, oh, you took the... I did. You took the board yep. off. But a uh, strong memory is of being in the religious science. Okay, hold on. Can you can you hear John or should I get the microphone? Please give him the mic. Okay, one second. Can... Yeah, we really need the mic. For... John's going to get the mic over there, John. The oh, mic's I, up. I was saying he's I can walk. Oh, you're, he's going to walk. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'll switch places. Oh, wow. We're all over the place tonight. <laughs> I have strong memories there, of uh, being in the religious science church that I grew up and in. What is religious science? Uh, religious science is a part of this um, whole idea of new thought. It's an offshoot of an offshoot of Christian science. Um, it came out of a group called Divine Science. And then there was a, yeah, and then it broke off with a guy named Ernest Holmes in the 1920s into religious science. Basically, one of the breaks behind it was we want to see doctors for like broken legs and stuff like that. And a little bit more not fully rejecting doctors like Christian science did, but um, in the religious science church that I grew up in, there were so many times that I heard, you have to tithe at least 10% of every paycheck. If you tithe any less, you will not be bringing abundance into your life and you will continue to be poor and stuff like that. It doesn't matter how, how much money or how little money you make, you have to tithe at least 10%. And the more you tithe, the better. So, <laughs> well, not all. I remember my mother was Thank you, John. It's not all. Some some don't. Oh, yeah. And of course, there's a spectrum. So, Daryl said that his mother was affiliated with it and they didn't do that. In fact, our home actually Yeah. And so, we're going to like talk about uh, 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 Liechtenstein as well. And then, I and specifically, um, one of the others uh, who helped who helped create Jewish science. But before we get there, we have to talk about what goes into this and we have to talk about new thought. And and also to sort of give you a hint about what's coming next week, um, how all of these ideas are tied together during a bunch of spiritual movements that emerged during the middle of the 19th century. So I'm not going to bore you with a huge history lesson. I'm just going to quickly tell you what all these things are and then how they sort of come together in uh, new thought. And then we'll move forward. So new thought. Basically, it's created by this gentleman named Phineas Quimby. Phineas Quimby is heavily influenced by these ideas up above here. So do any of you know what transcendentalism is? Yep. Have you heard that? Yeah. What's transcendentalism? Are you? <laughs> yeah, no, it's the that's the the whole thing with um it's like a it's it's like a cross between like the 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 uh, <laughs> so no, I, I know what we, we have all heard we all learned about transcendentalism when we were in high school and we read about he uh, not Hemingway we read about uh Thoreau and Emerson, yeah. Thoreau and Emerson yeah. right yeah and Thoreau and Emerson were transcendentalists they were uh very very interested in eastern philosophy they were incredibly interested in they read uh translations of the Bhagavad Gita and of the Rig Veda and other forms of eastern thought religion and philosophy and they sort of there, there was this the, the idea of sort of um, transcending the self. That's where transcendentalism comes from or transcending the ego and emerging almost in a type of enlightenment beyond the ordinariness of who we are in the here and now. They were very, very interested in that. What's that? Self-reliance. 
Yeah, and then self-reliance, oh. right? Yeah, and it basically focus on the self. It's about the self and about transcending the ordinariness of the self, but also that the self can do this sort of enlightening sort of thing. Um, and they were very prominent in upper class uh, New England society. And it's out of upper class New England that a lot of the, and also other parts of the Eastern seaboard, um, especially New York and North, that a lot of these ideas come out of. Um, they were some of the first people to popularize Eastern tradition ideas. And they would go to, especially their next generation of transcendentalists, um, uh, maybe about 20 years after them, they would get together in parlors and they would talk about these ideas. And around the same time out of Europe comes this, uh, th this, this parlor trick called mesmerism, right? Mm -hmm. And mesmerism, you probably associate it as a synonym with hypnosis. Mm -hmm. um, and there are aspects of hypnosis and psychotherapy that come out of this. It's the idea that you can use the power of your mind to manipulate the, what's called the ether, sort of the spiritual space around the body or the mind, and that this can help heal people. And so these mesmerists would come from Europe and they would go to these New England parlors and folks who were influenced by the transcendentalists because they were part of the same cultural milieu, they would go here and they would watch, they, they, they would go and watch these, um, these mesmerists do hypnosis essentially, right? And heal people, supposedly. I think it's interesting because transcendentalism is actually the um yeah. movement. And it so is. it's interesting how it descends into charlatanism. So I want to uh, <laughs> Alexa says it's interesting how transcendentalism is a legit movement that descends into charlatanism. Um we are looking at this. I, I prefer to look at this. I'm not gonna tell you how to look at it. Uh if you were a grad student of mine, I would. But <laughs> no, I prefer to look at this as these as religious movements, right? And there are lots of religious movements that are not verifiable, right? That have no physical, you know, legitimacy, as it were. One of them is Judaism, right? There, uh, Judaism has makes supernatural claims. Absolutely, right? So when I look at these, I don't agree with these. I don't, I don't agree with these. Um, but I still sort of recognize them as religious movements. I understand that there is there's charlatan like behavior in many of these. Um, but to learn about them, like I, for me personally, it's not, I don't find that as helpful, but I totally know that I'm fighting an uphill battle here. I get that. Okay. So, but you're right. Transcendentalism is a, uh, it, it is a philosophical and literary movement. And those who are part of this movement would get together at in these parlors and they would invite these mesmerists over for a type of show, right? And in, 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 uh, where people would be hypnotized. Around the same time, and I'm, I'll go into this a little more next week. I'll go into the history of this because it's fascinating. People also start engaging in seances where they get together and they talk to ghosts. They would summon ghosts. And all of this sort of happens around the same time. Now, how do you summon a ghost? You pray, you will the ghost into existence, you engage in affirmations, you tell the ghost that you have its best interest at heart, you, you use the power of your mind to bring a ghost into the physical world. And so you can see how all these ideas sort of come together and they influence a number of these people who end up creating new thought. And one of these people is Phineas Quimby. And Phineas Quimby develops this idea that he, he takes it partially from uh, the mesmerists, uh, the idea that we can um, heal ourselves of physical ailments. And we can, and later he'll say, and we can bring abundance to ourselves. John used the word abundance, right? You don't hear people say abundance that often. When do we see the word abundance? On Thanksgiving, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, like you think of a cornucopia or something like that. You rarely hear the term abundance. When I hear someone say, I'm seeking abundance, almost always it's new thought. Because And that word is a very old word, right? We only hear, we, we think it, it is an idea that's sort of associated with the past and it only comes into the present through new thought. And so Phineas Quimby is seen as the inventor of new thought. Um, and he believed that by using, basically, he believed that, uh, um, well, here, let me read what he says, right? So he says, the trouble is in the mind, the body is the only house for the mind to dwell in, right? So essentially what he's saying, therefore, if your mind has been deceived by some invisible enemy into a belief, you have put it into the form of a disease. What he's getting at there is that the only true thing 
The only thing that really exists is the mind, right? The, the, the spiritual essence of the mind. And that therefore the body is not truth. The body is immaterial, not immaterial, but it's sort of illusory, which is an idea that can be traced back to the transcendentalists who are engaging that's their understanding of Hindu philosophy, right? Um, the body doesn't really exist and therefore we can use the mind to heal disease. There must be something wrong with our mind if we are experiencing disease. Oh, oh no. Oh yeah, yeah, there's a low battery alert. Hold on everybody, let me see if I can fix this. Hold on. Yeah, 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 that's what I mean by fix this. <laughs> Dude, yeah, you might make electrical yeah. <laughs> I should have used the power of my mind. I was going to say that. Sure. Yeah. Just <laughs> think it's going to work. <laughs> okay. So, Daryl, go ahead. I'm wondering if they were trying to explain something that already existed. Because when they say, I think I mentioned something about living in the blue zone behind me. No mysticism or anything. The guy. Uh, moved back to his hometown, which is mm -hmm. in the blue zone. That's a whole other one, too. But, uh, and he moved back and he had six months to live, and he could afford to go to the best doctors. He had cancer, lung okay. cancer, I believe. No question about it. He moves back to his hometown. He wants to die there. He's still alive 27 years later with no sign of cancer. He didn't have to be yeah. religion or anything. Well, okay. I mean, I so like yeah, the, yeah. So, so Daryl's describing an incident where someone who had cancer ended up didn't have any sort of treatment and ended up living um, for like twenty seven more years. Oh, so this is, but this is one so person. To a place the the, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't. Sometimes, like, I mean, I can't explain that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that. that no, it doesn't. It explains why they created this movement. To okay, so th that's true. Yes, so it, 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 so this movement is created. This movement is created. New thought, and then later on, Christian Science is created because this is a time when you cannot where where and this is why it's called science. By the way, you do not have. No one had access to decent medicine. Right. And so you had to come up with a new way of healing. And this is why you hear in this language this emphasis on healing, not this emphasis on like medicine, not an emphasis on like going to a physician, not an emphasis on, um, you know, I don't know, you know, pharmaceuticals or whatever, an emphasis on this sort of, again, older type of language, healing. Who really outside of this realm? Who really talks about healing anymore? Well, and I think it's also oh. interesting too because at the time when we were still dealing with, you know, using uh, bloodletting or yeah. bloodletting into the 19th century, they're so, doing things that would make people more weak. And Alexis is describing people. things like bloodletting. And, and yeah. things that, I mean, many of the medical things at the time. Yeah. Did, she, did she say the use of leeches? Yes. Uh, yeah. Leeches. Yeah. 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 leeches and also like cuts and stuff like that. So these other older forms of medicine um, that at the time, yeah, so so Christian science, which has now become and other forms of new thought, where we now see as a rejection of a modern medicine at the time, it, right. yeah, is, is as close as you're going to get to modern medicine, right? We don't... Yeah. Let, by the way, they still use leeches on occasion for certain well, ailments. So Genevieve says it's the equivalent of taking mercury pills or colloidal silver, which are all still things people do. That's Darryl, poison. It's po yeah, I agree. Mercury is poisonous. Daryl says in the 19th century, you're better off so going to a doctor. Yeah. Today it's different. Yeah. So Daryl says in the 19th century, you were better off not going to a doctor. The doctors couldn't heal you. It makes sense why this would be the case. And this brings us to Mary Baker Eddy and the founder of Christian Science. So again, just to jump through with her really quickly, although she shouldn't have been doing much jumping. Um, Mary Baker Eddy was born in uh, Lynn, Massachusetts. And um without going through her whole background, what you need to know about her is that she is prone to, grows up prone to accident, accidents and illnesses. She is very, she's described as being a frill child. She's always sick. She always has some sort of cold. She has injuries. Um, she falls down a lot. And she basically spends the majority of her life until, you know, approximately in her thirties, she spends the majority of her life um, in you know in the sick bed uh either injured or sick 
And this sort of comes to a head when she is walking along the ice um, during a, a winter in Lynn, Massachusetts, and she slips and she's completely laid out and she's brought into her bed. And while she's there, she's given a Bible and she begins to pray. And she prays and she prays and she prays for a number of days. And then suddenly she finds herself healed. And she begins to go on, she goes on, she embarks on this sort of spiritual journey where she develops this idea that if you affir affir affirmatively pray and you focus on th that you, that this is an actual sign, there is scientific proof that if you pray and have good affirmative thoughts, you can br bring about healing in yourself. Where's the scientific proof, you may ask? Well, Mary Baker Eddy would say it's her. She's the scientific proof. Now, anyone who knows anything about science knows that this is not rigorous adherence to scientific method. But, but again, then it would be her students as well. Mary Baker Eddy quickly gets a number of students. And look at where she lives. She lives in Massachusetts. She's somewhat upper middle class. So Mary Baker Eddy is going to these mesmerist gatherings in people's parlors. She um, is going to lectures on theosophy. She is going to seances. In fact, there's some evidence that she might have engaged in a seance or two when uh, she was younger. And so she probably was aware of all this before this formative event. She probably, if she wasn't studying with Quimby, she was studying with other mesmerists and she was part of this world before the fall. But after, after her fall, um, she starts to coalesce all these ideas into her form of, uh, of, of new thought, basically. And she breaks away from Quimby and creates Christian science. She forms uh, basically the Church of Christ Scientist. And it's sort of out of her that, that, that eventually John mentioned religious science, well, divine science first, right? Yeah. So divine science, and then, yeah, there's so many of these things. And and, and there are proponents or, or people who are disciples of Quimby, people who are disciples of Mary Baker Eddy, people who are just, Unity. yeah, what's that? Yeah, the Unity Group, yeah. Um, Unity came out of this. That's a... Unitarian Universalism. No, 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 Unitarian, that's a, no, the Unitarian Universalism, no, Universalism breaks away from the Congregationalist movement. Oh, I yeah. thought they were part of this whole... I mean, I can see how they get into it, because it's in the same region, right? Yeah. Um, Unitarians are in. Are no, in no, no. I, I, my under, Unitarians, as far as I know, are a breakaway from the Congregationalist movement in New England, uh -huh. um, which are like small Christian churches, basically that have roots with the Puritans. Um, but I, but I have, I'm, I'm curious now. So I'm going to do some research and find out. Uh, Daryl, go ahead. The Unitarian Church, according to Rabbi Einstein, it's a bunch of Jesus followers. You go to the door. If you go to if you go to one of these churches, it doesn't it doesn't sound all that different to Judaism as far as philosophy, other than they don't have all the prayer. Yeah, I, I yeah. thought it was just more of a progressive. Um, so. They don't talk about I, I'm yeah. almost, they don't talk. So Daryl says uh, that Rabbi Einstein said that like a bunch of Jews formed the Unitarian Church. I, I'm going to do some research now, yeah. but I'm almost entirely sure like that this is a congregationalist movement. This is a breakaway movement that comes out of um, out of the Puritan movements and out of like Dutch reform Presbyterianism, I believe, and forms basically a Christian church without Christ. And every encounter that I've had with Unitarians, and I don't mean encounter like, you know, we met in the alley or something like that, or, or that it was like a, a, yeah, a street, right? Can you imagine such a thing? It was between Reformed Jews and the Unitarians. Um, has, has been, they have been very Christian without being Christian, or I should say very Protestant without being Christian. Uh, Sherry, go ahead. So Sherry's describing uh, an event that she went to. Yeah, I'm not familiar with what that is. Twenty years ago, every year they had a conference, and also something you would be involved with if it was today. It was a, a big. We went to the conference on alternative Jewish education, which was uh, there's a conference on alternative Jewish education. Yeah, which was formed, which was run by the committee 
It was like my organization, JEA. No, but, but I'm just going to say, and they held a conference every year of all different denominations of Jews. They had little mini mm -hmm. seminars. They would all help you there. Okay, so it's a conference with lots of different denominations. And the clergy, very interesting. And they studied many of these and many of you. And so much of that is in the space. We were doing wonderful things about Jesus. They were. Um, the, the, um, the top, the top okay. Of, 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 all right. So were they were they doing some sort of like something that was similar to this? Okay. So we did, and the class was full. We 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 couldn't get enough. Okay. But Sherry, can I stop you because I need to move on with the, uh, and then we can like, uh, yeah. okay, all right. Okay. And wanted to talk in front of the class about an experience seeing somebody who was, who Oh, was so, okay, so they were asking you if you, like, so it almost was like a seance sort of thing. Oh. Yeah. So these ideas, these ideas um, of, of new thought and of spiritualism, they permeate American consciousness. And we're going to continue that idea next week. Uh, yeah. And we get them so much. We actually saw them and we spoke to them. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, it's very, very common belief. Okay. So. Hey, y'all. So let me let's I, I, I do want to finish the, at least this slide tonight and then um yeah okay no worries um so out of this milieu of christian science emerges out actually out of religious science emerges uh jewish science and uh daryl mentioned uh rabbi lichtenstein it's also sort of uh, event, uh, he and rabbi alfred moses these are reform rabbis during the early 20th century and they form this group. And they initially, they, they were, well, not initially, the whole purpose is to pull back Jews who had been brought into Christian science. Mm -hmm. So during in the, in, the, in the middle of the 19th century, into the early 19th century, again, we're talking about upper class society. And this is before we see major um, uh, influx of Eastern European Jewish immigrants. So the Jews who are in the United States at this time are Reformed Jews who are Western Ashkenazi, primarily a handful of Sephardim, but mostly West, Western Ashkenazi. And they live in the cities, right? In Cincinnati, where HUC begins, in New York, in Boston. And they are part of a upper middle class society, or as much as they are allowed to be as Jews. And so they would have gone to these events, and they would have been fascinated by this and just like their non-Jewish contemporaries and they would have said because they are affected by the lack of medicine like everyone else they would have been they, they and they did say well I want to do this sort of healing as well and many of them end up joining Christian science um so seeing this this rabbi Alfred Moses he looks at this and he says there's a problem. We're losing Jews to essentially Christianity because Christianity, in its late uh, towards the end of Mary Baker's Mary Baker Eddy's life, takes on a distinctly Christian character, um, intentionally so to bring to give it more legitimacy. And so you're losing Jews to Christianity. And so he says, "Well, I need to sort. We need to sort of create this alternative that is going to sort of divert attention from Mary Baker Eddy and then also all of the other spinoffs." that had a more overtly Christian component to them as well. And there are many of them, right? Many, many of those. So um, so ultimately, Jewish science is a derivative of new thought. Um, and it, it's and, and the idea is to initially was to pull Jews out of uh, the sphere of, Christ, of Christian science and then other forms of faith healing as well. This one based, I believe, on Alfred Moses, Rabbi Alfred Moses, probably when the first 
1916, and Mordecai Lichtenstein, I believe, published in 1922, but Ernest Holmes published in 1927 and 1928. You get to see these outlays. Well, yeah, so, so Gerald's mentioning the publishings of these individuals and also Ernest Holmes, who exactly. was with religious yeah. science. So uh, these were all contemporaries. They knew each other. Now, when I, if I may, the short version. Well, here, how about, can I, let me, it's eight o'clock, so let me just finish this really fast, and then you can tell me afterwards, okay? So, um, what are some of the basic ideas of this group, of this idea of Jewish science? Um, Rabbi Alfred Moses and Mordecai Lichtenstein saw Jewish science as more of a science than Mary Baker Eddy ends up making Christian science into. The idea is that you can still be Jewish, you can even be secular, you just need to sort of see God not as a spiritual entity, or rather a, a like a, a theistic like you know deity but as an energy force and that energy force language is part of uh the language of both like the early mesmerists but also contemporary new age things as well he also brings in uh affirmative prayer but the key thing about uh about these individuals about jewish science is that they view this not as a new religion they view it as a supplement to Judaism. The other key thing about them is that they do not believe in uh, rejecting medicine. They believe, yeah, right? They're, they're, John says, yeah, they're Jews, of course. So where what they take on, though, is the notion of, of healing, self-healing, and self-help. Self-healing, self-help, self-affirmation, it has its roots in new thought, and it's going to continue into the next two movements that we'll talk about, maybe not next week, but the week after, Kabbalah, Kabbalah Center, and sort of Jewish engagement with Eastern traditions. Okay, so I'm going to end it there for the day. All right. Um, but you didn't answer. Oh. It's okay. I'm going to miss you the next part. What? About like the um, cult, right? Yeah, you've been, been, she's been going, but what, oh. what's a cult? So Hillary says, what's a cult? Um, how about I answer that at the end of this unit? Okay. okay. All right. All right. Because we have to learn about ghosts next next week. Okay. All right, everybody online. It was wonderful seeing you, and I will see you uh, next week, hopefully in person if you can make it. If not, no big deal. We are going to talk. We're gonna we're gonna deviate out of looking just at. Well, we didn't talk about that much Jewish stuff today. But remember, this class is not just about being Jewish in America. It's about being Americans as well. And all of these ideas are quintessential to. Americanness, and so that's why we're going to talk about these ghosts next next week, right? Do we have to wear Halloween costumes? If you like to, if you want to, you're welcome to. <laughs> but I'll wear a costume. No, I'm not going to do that. Actually, I know I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the share, and then I will end uh, this. I'll see everyone soon. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks.